anyway, yeah, thank you uh, also for having me today, giving me time to uh, set out a little bit more broadly my experience with uh, technology, machine translation in particular, my uh, also thoughts about how this impact our practice as language educators. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, maybe uh, give you also a couple of, uh, at a couple of points, some time maybe to ask a question or come back to me. So I don't want to have it entirely sort of uh, a monologue of my part and some questions afterwards, but maybe within a couple, uh, at a couple of points, we can have maybe one or two questions as well. I hope that works. It's the first time for me as well in special chat. Uh, let's see. Yes, yeah, so most of you may uh, have uh, met me already. I've met some of you, of course. There are lots of colleagues from Nottingham here. Uh, I know uh, a few others I've seen on the list. Uh, and you know already uh, a few things about myself. I, I'll mention just obviously briefly. Uh, I work as a lecturer in German at the University of York. And what is maybe interesting here is that languages at York are within one department, within the Department of Language and Linguistic Science. And my practice very much evolves uh, alongside the practice of uh, my colleagues in French, Spanish, and Italian, the three other languages we teach at undergraduate level. Uh, but I'm not only uh, a lecturer, a teacher, an educator. I've been having the role of program leader for languages uh now for a number of years as well and this is also uh these two aspects are also informing uh my perspective on uh the topic today on the one hand obviously i've experienced the advent of machine translation in uh, my classroom practice through student use etc and many of you will have at the same uh, but also as program leader, where I look more on pro, uh, also over the curricula, uh, questions of uh, quality assurance and assessments. Uh, I've also experienced this uh, side of machine translation, the considerations of uh, being it a form of cheating, academic misconduct, etc. Uh, now, in the talk today, I, I won't. I will focus uniquely on the question of language education, not so much these questions of assessment, misconduct, uh, ethical questions. It pops up a couple of times probably, but that's not the focus. I really am now more interested in uh, how to, uh, what to do with machine translation in our teaching practice ultimately. Uh, so that's about myself, but I also want to, uh, if that works, Yes, uh, say a couple of things where I come from as a la or how I see me as a language edu educator, what I uh, think about the lang what language learning is. And I've put up a couple of bullet points to give you a bit of an idea where I'm coming from. Uh, language learning is communicative and social. So in a way for me, language learning is to a certain extent always a co-construction. It's uh, uh, developing in communication with others. It's a social, essentially a social process. So language learning is never only about the individual. And I think that's very important. Language learning is, I put plurilingual. Uh, language learning does not uh, function in an isolated uh, sort of linguistic or language space, the, the language of study, uh, language learning always uh, evolves in a plurilingual space where all the other languages uh, come into play as well. Language learning is open-ended. Uh, there is no end point. I mean, this is a bit contested also in second language acquisition uh, research. But in that sense, for me, language learning uh, has no target, no end point. It's a developing of uh, communicative resources uh, and ever growing uh, of these resources, but it has, doesn't have an end point. In that sense, the end point is not or is neither uh, the virtual or real native speaker or this ideal. It's not an approach to a certain ideal. Language learning is embodied and multimodal. Uh, 
Our whole body is involved when we learn language. Language learning is to also to do with the way we experience the world, not only cognitively, but also through our body. Uh, and this might sound particularly in the context of uh, computer uh, aided or uh, mediated communication, working with these devices, digital devices may sound uh, a bit odd or uh, maybe far-fetched, but even in contact with computers, uh, our bodies are involved. And there is actually some quite interesting research about how interacting with computer is also a form of uh, embodiment and, and has an effect on our bodies. Language learning is also multimodal. Uh, languages evolve not isolated as um, systems of, of simple systems, other uh, systems, uh, like visual systems come into play as well, or other modes of communication. And finally, language learning is transformative and political. Uh, transformative in the sense it uh, transformative for the learner. Uh, it changes the identity, who the learner is. Uh, the learner uh, develops new ways of seeing the world, of being in the world. Uh, it changes uh, their identity. And in that sense, it's also political, not only in the current context where we can see a decline in language uptake, language learning means also promoting languages, uh, is obviously against the political also trend of uh, maybe neglecting or suppressing languages. Uh, but it's also political in the sense that uh, it enables the individual to uh, have different views, perspectives, on the world. So that's just a bit of a, an overview of where I'm coming from as a language educator. Gives you an idea. And some of the uh, themes will uh, pop up later again. Let's uh, come to uh, the talk. And before I, I come to the uh, various uh, parts, I just want to say that uh, 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 or want to issue a word of caution or warning, uh, so to set your expectations right. Uh, I'm not coming here as, as the uh, finished expert in all uh, questions, machine learning, uh, machine translation, or even artificial intelligence technology. Uh, I'm come very much from my own experience as language educators, educator. Uh, and I also think there are no, uh, not always right or wrong answers, certainly not definitive answers. Uh, what I am aiming is just to uh, give you some ideas to explore further, articulate some questions and challenges that arise, and maybe also change uh, your perspective on some of the issues discussed. So there are there won't be definite answers or recipes. Uh, and given that some of the uh, things that we will discuss uh, later on uh, evolve so fast, uh, it's also very difficult to to get to have this stance of being the uh, super expert. Uh, okay, so basically, and if you have read my my. Uh, abstract where I said I, come, I will come from from two angles to uh, machine translation and machine translation literacy literacy uh, this is what you will uh, see a little bit here as well uh, first I will talk a little bit about uh, the digital age uh, what does it mean to uh, teach learn and use languages in the digi digital age uh, we will talk about the concept of uh, language proficiency and how this concept might uh, be need to be re-evaluated. Re and in the second and third part, uh, I'll talk about first machine translations, maybe some basics, uh, a bit of a background, uh, and also its uh, effect on language education, especially uh, through uh, some of the research uh, that has been undertaken into machine translation and language education. And finally, I get to the concept of machine translation literacy and how we 
can adapt this concept and make it useful for language education, what we can take away from this. Right, uh, let's start up with the digital age. Uh, I've, got, I've put a few uh, points here uh, up on the slide. Uh, when it has started or not is a bit debatable, but we uh, maybe can uh, see nowadays that uh, digital technologies and devices are basically present everywhere in our everyday lives. Uh, we are uh, connected uh, with uh, devices, but also with people more or less constantly, what Wellman and Kwan has uh, called hyperconnectivity. But this gives us also instantaneous access, more or less, uh, to information, uh, to data. Uh, at the same time, there is also a vast data collection about human interaction and behavior. Uh, and obviously, if you think about Alexa or a device like Google, uh, what is it called? I don't know uh, now, but like Alexa, uh, but all the devices as well, they constantly uh, also collect data about our lives, our uh, actions, but also our communication and behavior. Uh, at the same time, on the technological level, uh, virtually unlimited, but they are not really unlimited, but uh, huge data processing capabilities. So computers uh, or machines have become uh, extremely uh, sophisticated in managing very large amount of data in very short in a very short amount of time. So. Uh, Digital technologies uh, have and are having a basically a formative, or I would say a transformative influence on people's lives. And if you just, and they have permeated our everyday life in a way, in, in so many ways, and not only uh, since COVID. I'm just thinking back at the uh, time when first the duo factor, what is it, certification was involved and you had to have your mobile phone, for example, with you to log on to your computer in the classroom. So the connection and the, the, the link to certain devices becomes ever uh, closer. But it means also what I call reconfiguration of spaces, places, and bodies. So certain relationships of, of spaces and places, but also bodies change uh, through, uh, for example, the use of devices, dig digital technologies, uh, now with also 3D printing, for example, objects can uh, move in ways they haven't moved, uh, they couldn't before. So that's a, a bit the idea of digital spaces. What I want to uh, say, however, is uh, that this is maybe a little bit also a Eurocentric view in the sense that uh, this is maybe particularly uh, prevalent in, in Europe or the US and other advanced, uh, economically advanced countries. Uh, we must not forget that there are uh, actually ever growing digital divisions uh, across the world. And if we talk about the digital age here and these phenomena, we must bear in mind that this may happen maybe in the UK or in Europe. Uh, but it's not the same across the world and in other areas of the world. And the second point I want to say that it's not sin only since COVID that we perceive this, but COVID has certainly accelerated some of these developments uh, and particularly uh, permeated uh, that these changes much more broadly across our, at least our societies and really many people now have been in contact with, I don't know, Zoom calls, remote working, etc. Now, uh, let's uh, look at language use in the digital age. With uh, the changes uh, or in this context, we see new communicative practices and situations. I've put here a few using emojis, listening to automated messages, music with lyrics, scrolling, uh, speaking to bots, texting, uh, reading automated subtitles, speaking to Alexa, etc. Uh, 
there emerge also new types of language. Uh, Angela Stora, for example, uh, actually for German is very interested in uh, the effect uh, of these new community practices on, for example, writing. She calls it, or what she calls interactive writing. Uh, she also sees a hybridization of speaking and writing in the sense that writing, which is traditionally uh, focused on uh, a specific written norm and is realized in texts mainly, is now realized in situations that are closer to uh, conversations, to what is uh, usually thought of oral uh, communicative situations. And this has effects on the way also we write. For example, we see new technologies <coughs> relevant for language use, and that's not only machine translation. We come to this. Uh, there is obviously uh, also, and you've maybe come across this speech recognition. There are text improvement, uh, but also even text production tools, uh, text to speech technology, lots of technologies that uh, work with language and ultimately also may have an effect on how we use language and for also in what situations and for what purposes. And lastly, uh, but very importantly, new types of interaction. And particularly, I mean here, human-computer interaction. So humans uh, interact now uh, on uh, ever uh, growing, uh, with an ever growing frequency, also with computers, with machines through bots, through chatbots, uh, and other uh, platforms. And I'll mention that a little later. So that's sort of a little bit the background, uh, the digital age language use. Now, we are all more or less in the business of basically helping uh, learners to develop uh, the use of a, a, a new language, a language of study, uh, and ultimately, uh, to de develop what uh, we often also call language proficiency. Uh, now, uh, if we uh, consider briefly language proficiency, uh, we need first to think about how uh, can we uh, grasp language proficiency? How can we talk about this? Uh, what the language proficiency of a specific learner, for example, is. Uh, and as Winke and Bonfart say, uh, language uh, proficiency is basically only observable through performance, ultimately. And this is sort of the common approach to determine uh, a person's uh, language proficiency. But I, what I would say here is, uh, as well is that if you think about performance, we need to bear in mind that uh, when we use language, uh, it, there are always more than one involved. Language is fundamentally communicative communication or a communicative act. So language performance uh, in, uh, is in that, that sounds never only uh, an individual uh, act or an individual uh, or be, is a, you can sort of boil it down to an individual. It's always a, a social act. I want to uh, stress this because it might be useful later on. Okay, what else can we uh, say about language proficiency? Well, there seems to be a consensus that it's a complex phenomenon. Uh, harsh uh, names a few uh, aspects, very much centered around more or less uh, classic language skills strategies and linguistic competences. Uh, but it is complex and it's not uh, only, for example, about uh, vocabulary grammar, uh, which is maybe a more traditional view of language proficiency. Uh, language proficiency uh, sort of, you can say, uh, is a concept uh, that is relevant not only uh, in uh, language education. Uh, it's obviously a concept also very much in second language acquisition research. Uh, we can include in language proficiency uh, or very often you know, uh, 
knowledge and skills are included and under knowledge and skills often also depending on terminology is referred to as procedural and declarative knowledge about the language uh, how uh, the way i use it the uh, way i can process it the way i can talk about it uh, in second language acquisition research which we could uh, say is a bit of a narrower uh, idea uh, of or concept of language proficiency uh, language proficiency is often uh, conceptualized as calf plus communicative adequacy calf means complexity of the language accuracy which is basically grammatical but also lexical accuracy l is lexis uh, and f is fluency so very much sort of the nuts and bolts of, of the traditional view of of language uh, proficiency and in newer research communicative adequacy also already broadens this idea but we find language proficiency obviously also in the sefer which is certainly uh, a very important document and framework within which probably most of us uh, will work uh, this, the Sefer talks about overall language proficiency uh, and divides it in, into basically uh, three categories of the general uh, communicative competence. Uh, and, and they say communicative language competences, activities, and strategies. And these three aspects uh, together build the overall and develop the overall language proficiency. The general competencies uh, have linguistic, social linguistic, and pragmatic uh, aspects. Now, uh, in the CEFI particularly, uh, obviously language proficiency levels uh, are important. Uh, as uh, Benitez and Lea say, uh, the uh, CEFI, the framework serves as a reference for language teaching in Europe is also referred to in professional contexts in which language competence needs to be assessed. So the CEFA in many ways has uh, dominated the way we describe proficiency, different proficiency levels. Uh, but uh, implicitly, the CEFA uh, is based on human performance alone. Uh, it describes uh, and talks about uh, uh, language performances at different levels. Uh, it never addresses it explicitly, but it's based on human performance. What about, oh, I forgot to add the sentence, but what about performance that is uh, not only or created uh, through the aid of, of tools? It's quite interesting that in the CEFA, even in the latest edition, 2018 or 2020, with the companion volume, vol uh, volume, there is no mention of digital capabilities in contributing to performance. And uh, this is actually really astonishing after already quite a few years of uh, where we see the impact of technology uh, on language learning. Okay, uh, now, obviously, as I said, our, we are all more or less in the business of uh, developing learners' language proficiency, uh, moving uh, forward, moving up levels. Uh, we, uh, in the CEFA, for example, gen they talk about the general language proficiency, which is obviously a concept that has subconcepts. Uh, but what is interesting here is, uh, how general proficiency is in a way represented in a more or less linear way, uh, but also in the sense that uh, higher levels of proficiency encompass the lower levels of proficiency. So it's a uh, it's an ever growing uh, and more uh, more encompassing uh, way of 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 uh, uh, being able to use 
language uh, in uh, a variety of situations or in different situations. Uh, there is obviously a, a recognition that uh, across different skills, there might be some variation. And this is a second image. Uh, you can draw proficiency profiles across different skills. Uh, but generally speaking, there is some variation. So these different uh, proficiency levels uh, still are more or less aligned. As I said, uh, we are in the business of uh, helping or supporting learners to develop language proficiency. Uh, and uh, in doing so, we can consider how teaching, learning, and using languages uh, are linked or come together. And I've put here two visuals a little bit. The second one I'm not too happy with, but uh, in a maybe more traditional way, we would see the contact, uh, the connection between uh, teaching, learning, and using the teacher, the learner, and the user in a, a maybe a little bit uh, linear or relatively linear way, in the sense that uh, the teacher is the proficient user, uh, whereas the learner in a way is a not so proficient or deficient user uh, who obviously tries to uh, develop his uh, proficiency to become a, a competent user. Uh, we can also see that basically uh, the learner learns what is taught in order to, after the learning process has taken place, being able to use the language. Uh, and of course, we don't see this in this strict linear way anymore. But in many ways, many aspects of teaching and learning are still organized around this in the sense that uh, associated to this, I should add here, is that in this sort of more traditional way, the teacher is also the dominant so, uh, mo uh, source for knowledge this a model for the language, and it has also, to a certain extent, privileged access to language material. Whereas the learner uh, performs uh, actions uh, and uh, communications that are devised by the teacher, uh, tries to uh, improve uh, his language proficiency uh, through the materials, uh, uh, through interaction with the materials, for example. Uh, and in order to become a competent user. Uh, in this relationship, there is also very much teaching and learning is centered around the classroom. Uh, it's the focus of the interaction between teacher and learner, uh, and also, to a certain extent, a spatial organization of the learning process. Uh, whereas the language user is obviously to a certain extent in the classroom as well as a simulation, but as the competent user is later on in real life in the uh, in the in the wild, if you want uh, to use this term. Uh, so this linear is obviously maybe a bit of uh, an overstatement, but that's sort of a very traditional way. Uh, we come to see teaching learning using obviously now in a more complex way. Uh, there is uh, teaching, using, and learning are basically intertwined. Uh, it's a complex uh, process and also a dynamic process. The language learner uh, is acquiring new language not only in the interaction with the teacher, uh, as we said before, new technologies. Uh, uh, give access to learners, to materials, to communications, to interactions outside the classroom, outside the control of the teacher as well. Uh, so uh, the formal learning process uh, is uh, only one aspect of, of learning languages. Uh, learners interact with resources and also apps, for example, that have no direct link necessarily to the learning environment. And the, the learner uh, can uh, 
use the language in authentic ways uh, that are neither controlled nor devised by the teacher. So uh, in that sense, uh, the, this linear relationship is uh, obviously no longer really uh, realistic, particularly in the, in the digital context with uh, the digital capabilities. Now, if you look at uh, teaching learning using languages, a few principles. Uh, as I said, the language learning is a language user. Uh, Nation uh, proposed already quite some time, actually, in a way, maybe pre-digitally, uh, a balanced curriculum uh, where uh, input, output, and language, meaningful input and output and language use, attention to form, uh, uh, and language awareness and, and fluency language automaticity, what it's called as well, uh, are in the center, sort of the more narrower elements of language learning. But we could, to this balanced curriculum idea, also add sociocultural knowledge, pragmatics, and also knowledge and use of tools and technology. Uh, still, we uh, Norm, uh, traditionally, uh, language development is seen as incremental and cumulative across different skills. Uh, what we also uh, would uh, add to uh, this uh, approach to teaching learning using languages is that authentic language use is a fundamental principle and also aim uh, for language development. But what about human-computer interaction and human-computer co-creation, which uh, we uh, also are able to do, and to a certain extent, uh, which we also do, which are also authentic uh, ways of using language. These are still basically generally left out. I want to, uh, before I'm, I move on, just add one aspect to uh, developments in uh, language education, which could be quite useful for our consideration of uh, machine translation. Uh, the one is uh, the so-called multilingual turn in second language acquisition, uh, where this idea is, uh, of language development of a specific focus on one language uh, is abandoned uh, based on a critique of monolingual uh, principles or theories, pedagogies and practices, uh, where the diversity and also plurality of learning uh, is uh, foregrounded. And as I said earlier as well, in the digital age with all these capabilities, the learning process uh, is not as sort of maybe controllable nor uh, linear as it may have been before. Languages are resources for meaning making uh, and not only uh, sort of resources for transaction. And finally, uh, what also is in the CEFA, but this concept of plurilingual community competence, which means that language learning and language development is not isolated in, this, in the monolingual sense, uh, independent from other languages, but it also uh, always uh, evolves language uh, development uh, happens in context of all the other language resources uh, a learner has. That's the first bit and the second bit, but linked to also the last point is what uh, was called the translational turn. Uh, I think I haven't put it now. It's, I think it's Guy Cook, maybe who has uh, put this uh, notion forward uh, in the sense that translation, which has been banned more or less and very viewed very critical, but if in communicative language teaching, uh, has made a bit of a compact, uh, comeback, but also in the sense that uh, translation, in a way, uh, is 
uh, the same as language use itself. So there are similarities in the sense that all language use uh, is uh, a way of translating, uh, of making meaning, uh, and uh, is uh, considered as as way of uh, also, and that's also in the Sephis, is mediating uh, uh, either concepts or text uh, between uh, uh, communicative uh, agents. And this translational turn uh, again opens up uh, a possibility again also for the uh, consideration of of translation as machine translation. Okay, if you think about language education in the digital age, uh, we can consider the what of language education and the how. How is it changing? Uh, if you think about the what of language education, we can uh, consider new forms and uses of languages. As I uh, said earlier, uh, we can consider uh, the plurilingual approach where we uh, take into account all language, uh, language resources, all repertoires the language learner has, not to exclude the first language, for example, or other languages, uh, and uh, to focus on languages as communicative and meaning-making resource rather than uh, a transactional tool. Uh, the how uh, changes language education, uh, we make use of authentic situations and relevant language, which also means we take into consideration uh, communicative situations that do happen uh, outside the classroom, which are new situations, as uh, mentioned before, and also relevant language. There were in German, for example, phenomena like clitics, the use of contractions, for example, etc. Uh, how do we? Uh, how does the? Uh, how happens in language education? Uh, we obviously already use a lot of digital tools. Some don't seem any very much new, like virtual learning environments are with our bread and putter. Uh, but there are language learning apps, platforms, etc., for collaboration, online uh, collaboration, etc. But also, uh, we uh, may consider inclusion of tools based on ultimately artificial intelligence, like machine translation, but also text editors, text production platforms, chatbots, etc. Now, uh, do we have to? Uh, have a tool-specific differentiation of language development. So that's one of the questions I ask myself. Uh, this idea of a uniform development of language proficiency uh, seem uh, to be difficult to maintain when some access, uh, when the access to some tools allow uh, a language use at a basically much more advanced level than it would. Uh, without the, the use of these tools be possible. Uh, and so that's one of the questions. I'll come to that later. So that's sort of the uh, broad ideas about language education. Uh, maybe we can take a minute or two for a question or a comment? Yeah, Thomas, I have one question about this very final point, and that's yeah. what we'll talk about this afternoon. Um, the tool specific um, differentiation, which I think is probably the way forward when it comes to digital learning and language assessment, mm -hmm. especially. Um, but do you have any ideas of how that could be done? Could be in the marking criteria or how would you make sure that the students as well as the teachers are aware that um, because the students can use certain tools, 
the it, standards are required, let's say. Of course. Uh, I mean, the if we are guided by the principle of authenticity, it depends on the situation. Uh, I guess in some situations, let's say in spoken interaction, uh, where the speed is quite important, at least until now, we don't have uh, interpreting facilities that would uh, facilitate that in the way we, we have for translation. Uh, that's one aspect. Another aspect is, uh, if I say authentic uh, communicative situations, with authentic, if it's a, it's a real life situations where we uh, engage students with uh, speakers of the language outside the classroom, for example, where uh, they would probably then draw more on their own resources because of time pressures, because of the situation, uh, rather than obviously uh, tools like uh, they can do for asynchronous communication where, where they have writing. Uh, I don't know, that's sort of the idea what, what I think uh, could be a way forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll uh, maybe uh, move on. Uh, there are a couple of questions, I think, in the chat. Okay. Um, Let's have a look. Well, uh, one was um, tips for yeah, um, I'm waiting for tips on how to implement digital. Yeah, I come to that. I come to that. Okay, right. Sorry, I've. Uh, okay. Machine translation. Let's uh, talk about this tool that uh, we try to grapple uh, with for quite some time. Just generally. We could consider this as automatic translation of a text from one language to another language without human in interaction. So uh, we put some text and the text can be one word or it can be a paragraph or it can be an essay. Uh, and we get an output uh, and this uh, is done without human intervention. And such, uh, it's differentiated for, for, uh, from, for example, computer assisted translation or dictionaries, glossaries that exist online as well. But with uh, these tools like computer assisted translation or dictionaries, glossaries, human intervention uh, is necessary. Uh, so now where does uh, digital machine translation come from uh, and how does it work? Uh, it has evolved roughly over the last uh, 70 years, maybe since the Second World War, uh, particularly, and we have here uh, a, a, a graph about uh, the different sort of types of uh, machine translation uh, since it's uh, basically the first broader development uh, after the war. And we can see basically in the three different colors, three types of machine translation. Uh, the first instance, and basically till the 1990s, uh, roughly, uh, is rule-based machine translation. And this means basically that uh, computers or machines uh, were programmed with rules, grammar, and lexicon. And the idea was that this would then basically uh, allow to translate from one language into another. Uh, and this more or less failed uh, in the sense that at least compared to what was uh, hoped for. Uh, and we know all the, the, uh, the problems and uh, obviously one important aspect to it is this, these machines cannot consider context in any way or sh shape or any way or form. And they basically, although the idea was that the computer works like the human, to a certain extent, in the sense that uh, it processes grammar rules and knowledge of the lexicon, for example. Uh, from the 19th onwards, is not, uh, uh, and the advances in the quality were uh, not that great. Uh, but from the 19th onwards, we have a statistical machine translation, where basically a fundamental shift to, uh, from rules to data happened. Uh, 
so the basis was not any more uh, grammar rules and lexicon. The basis was basically uh, data of uh, uh, translate translation data of of translated texts and uh, machine translation uh, tried to process uh, basically the probability of of certain words in certain contexts uh, and try to identify patterns uh, in how words are uh, used in different languages. And there are different sort of types of statistical translation, uh, machine translation. Uh, I don't want to go into detail, but what we have now uh, from roughly 2016 is uh, neural machine translation. Uh, and this is basically the state of the art. Uh, they are still data driven. Uh, they uh, are able to uh, process uh, enormous amount of, of data. They also need enormous amount of training data. Uh, I'll come to a representation in a minute. Uh, they uh, are based on so-called neural networks, which means basically multiple computational layers with uh, multiple ways of processing information uh, with uh, based on algorithm on uh, what to uh, consider what context of a word is relevant, what class of the world is relevant, etc. Uh, they are forms of machine learning or also called now deep learning in the sense that they process uh, uh, very large amounts of data. What is important here to notice as well is there is uh, what is called algorithmic bias. So the uh, machine uh, only uh, know or can do what it has learned. And if the learning data has a certain bias, one example is, for example, that uh, some languages uh, don't specify the gender uh, of human agents, others do. And that translation then, uh, based on the uh, training data, came up with, uh, for example, for my coworker, uh, is working hard. Mein Mitarbeiter uh, in the muscular form, or my co worker is uh, gossiping a lot. Uh, meine Mitarbeiterin uh, schwätzt viel, for example. That has been now uh, already rectified, but these are the types of algorithmic bias that happen. Uh, and uh, a last point I want to mention is uh, whether neural machine translation. Uh, Broadly speaking, they uh, work in the context of, uh, of artificial intelligence with the same, with very similar principles. Uh, but there is sort of the question whether it is artificially intelligent or whether uh, human computer interaction would be a more appropriate way of seeing this as it is not really a form of intelligence. But I leave that open. I have on the next slide. Uh, a representation, uh, but I don't want to uh, go into too much detail. Uh, just uh, think of uh, the bilingual corpora as the massive training data, and the machine tries basically to predict translations with as, as little errors as possible. And in the, in the middle, these multiple layers of neural networks uh, where the computation uh, happens. Uh, OK, the platforms. Most of you may have come, and the most important one is obviously Google Translate. Uh, but particularly for the German context, DeepL is maybe also particularly interesting. There are others. Most of these are free, or at least free for to a certain degree, so they can be used by uh, whoever uh, wants to. Just a screenshot, uh, this is DeepL. What is interesting here, for example, DeepL has an input and an output uh, window, but it has also a window where you can select a formal or informal translation, which is already uh, tries to include a bit more contextual information. Uh, here, uh, I have an example of uh, two translations that just I did, but that would be similar to a task in language learning through Google Translate. Uh, 
Dear Klaus, I hope you're having okay. So the, the task is uh, you have met uh, Klaus, a student on your year abroad in Hamburg. Task, write a letter after you have returned and talk about what you're doing. Uh, make some suggestions for potential visit of Klaus. And this is just the beginning. But what I want to highlight here is uh, you can see actually uh, a couple of uh, differences in how Google Translate changes the translation just by the difference whether University of York is capitalized or not capitalized. And uh, this shows that the translator doesn't has no concept of, for example, a capital letter or not capital letter. Is that a noun or not? Cannot identify uh, whether it's an error or not. Uh, whereas a human ultimately uh, immediately understands that both are the same. Uh, the computer uh, calculates differently, creates different connections and different probabilities, and comes up with something completely different. But we should bear in mind that translation is not about the words. It's what about the words are about. I, I like this quote. Uh, and this uh, goes to show where is the computer basically very much computes uh, words, uh, tries to predict uh, the probability how works, uh, fi words fit together rather than uh, really uh, translate concepts, what the words are about. Uh, maybe I, I skip about MT and artificial intelligence to come to the suggestions, seeing that the, the time has moved on quite a bit. If you are interested, and I'm sure you have all heard and read about chat GPT3 GPT uh, and other potentially uh, chain, uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, tools that may change the way we uh, work at university. Uh, generally, uh, machine translation can be seen as a subfield of artificial intelligence. And the basis is what is called uh, large language models, which uh, try to uh, calculate the probability uh, of a certain word distribution and try to predict words and how they fit together. That's also why uh, newer models uh, produce relatively fluent text. It may not always be correct, but it's quite fluent. Okay, there is chat GPT. You can have a look. I've got a couple of screenshots, but maybe I'll move over these. Uh, machine translation language education. Uh, so the 2006 Google Translate was uh, released and everybody could access it. And since 2016, uh, new, Google's Neural Machine Translation tool was released, which a much higher level of uh, accuracy translations become relatively good. And if you have tried it already, you know that. If we come back to the language proficiency, for example, for written production, according to Benitez and Lair, uh, Neural machine translation uh, can translate texts uh, for written production up to B2 level. Level, level C1 and C2 uh, may need human intervention, but that's how good basically machine translation is. Now, how has uh, machine translation influenced language education? Uh, Jolly and Maimon, uh, and this is basically the go-to article if you're interested in this. Uh, they uh, published in recently 30 years of machine translation and language education, a review of the literature, which uh, you really get a good insight what's out there, uh, what have uh, people looked at, what studies have been done. Uh, we know that uh, Language learners use MT tools. Uh, they use it for learning, but also general uh, purposes. And they use it mainly for single word or short phrases. I've summarized this here, uh, and I'll just go over because we're a bit of over time. Sorry about that. 
if you think about teachers and also learners' attitudes, uh, there is this idea of friend versus foe. So there is this ambivalence. Some want to ban it, other in integrate. But there, I would say there is a, a tendency to more to move towards integration. If, uh, and students are generally more accepting. Uh, how in or affect uh, how does machine translation affect language learning? Uh, it facilitates the production of longer and more accurate texts, but uh, it has a relatively negative uh, uh, effect, or there is limited evidence of a positive impact for language development in the novel sense. Uh, and this is why I think uh, this study uh, is very interesting because Helmich like, uh, did not, like many other studies, basically ask people and students and staff as well what they think about translation but and how they use it. But uh, Helmich basically did uh, a computer tracking student a study where she uh, observed students on tasks, uh, 20 fixed learners, beginner level. Uh, they recorded how they completed tasks, had a, re a recall uh, shortly afterwards, and then an interview. And what she found, and this is particularly interesting for practice, is that students uh, input either too little or too much. Uh, but some successful MT users uh, used strategies, uh, for example, like uh, comparing different types of input, comparing different types of output. So those who were successful, they basically spent more time in reflecting upon input and output. Uh, and this is basically where we uh, could maybe uh, develop our practice to include machine translation and to, uh, into language education and to think about how machine translation can help a language learners to develop their uh, competence. It's basically machine translation literacy comes uh, uh, very much developed by Ling Bauke. Uh, and it's uh, about uh, developing knowledge and skills of using uh, machine translation in an informed way. The concept itself uh, was developed by Bauke, not for a wide range of audiences, uh, but basically supporting uh, globally op operating communities, such as, for example, academics, uh, translation needs uh, of uh, people who want to publish in different languages, for example. Uh, and what I'll here try to do is to adapt this to language education. So now what is trans machine translation literacy? Uh, what does an educated use of machine translation look like? What is important is awareness of machine translation. Also knowing the risks. One aspect of machine translation is data you input uh, is owned by Google, for example. Transparency, to be open about the use of machine translation. Uh, there is more than one tool. So encourage users to compare uh, what different tools can do. And the famous uh, saying garbage in, garbage out, to uh, be aware that the quality of the input uh, is very uh, relevant to the quality of the output. Uh, what could that mean for language education? We could uh, include uh, teaching uh, students knowledge about machine translation, underlying principles, affordances, what can they do, uh, how do they work, uh, where are strengths and weaknesses, the role of training da data and algorithmic bias, <clears throat> and which tools are available, what they can do and not. Uh, we can uh, engage with machine translation for writing and producing language. Obviously, that's uh, what most, uh, I think, uh, 
of of the studies they've done, but also developing language awareness. Consider, for example, different types of output, but also consider output. Uh, <clears throat> and we can look at the role of the input. What do we input in the uh, machine translation? Pre, what is also called pre-editing, uh, or the role of the output, which is post-editing. What to do with the output? Uh, what I would say, an effective and ethical use of machine translation uh, could, for example, uh, differentiate uh, between beginners and more intermediate and advanced learners, where the beginners could focus more on the input, uh, according to the principles, not too much, not too little. Uh, also, uh, and also pre-editing input. Uh, so uh, how do, what do you input so that you can also still understand the output of machine translation at your level and understanding how the input and output uh, go together? Whereas uh, advanced learners could obviously work with post-editing tasks, uh, comparison of different tools, uh, and also then uh, talk about language awareness, contextual factors. Uh, I've forgotten to add this, sorry. Uh, and now I've got a couple of examples, pre-editing input tasks. Uh, this is just an example of Google uh, Translate, showing dif how differences of, uh, uh, of output by one input, let's say the word fly, to fly, flying kiss, uh, how to modify the input uh, has an effect on the output at a comprehensible level then particularly, but we can see also flying kiss, fliegen the kuss, sort of this uh, idiom cannot really uh, processed well by uh, Google Translate. DBL can do this, for example. A post-editing task. Imagine this uh, situation, write up a response in German to, uh, to a person email you have received from a friend, which is a classic sort of uh, task, I think. Use the machine translated version and create an improved version. Uh, I've taken this from an English uh, teaching manual as prompt, and I, I've written myself uh, uh, an answer in English and input this. And we can see that Google Translate and DeepL uh, in the yellow, you can see some errors, uh, either pragmatic more or also lexic or uh, idiomatic. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the deep L uh, on the, in the green. Uh, they uh, basically have a slightly uh, better version, but still some uh, issues. Ich muss jetzt gehen, uh, remain, I have to go, uh, is not something we would write in German. And to pragmatic rules and cultural norms, uh, for example, as uh, in this paper, I'm discussing the benefits of global warming. Uh, in diesem Papier diskutiere ich die Vorteile der globalen Erwärmung. At a very advanced level, uh, we wouldn't use in diesem Papier, for example, we wouldn't use potentially diskutiere, like DPL can do that, for example, better. Uh, okay, some strategies. Uh, and then I I finish. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, really uh, over the time now, but I'm I'm nearly there. Uh, a stronger focus on reflection analysis of language uh, through pre-editing and post-editing tasks, noticing attention and language awareness uh, can be uh, practiced or, or developed, but also cross-linguistic contrasts. Uh, as I said earlier, we may think of a differentiation of tasks, whereas writing tasks with MT use, and asynchronous communication usually, whereas synchronous speaking tasks uh, without MT use. And potentially, because you mentioned assessment, we may have to leave language accuracy in written assessments out and focus on pragmatics, on cultural convention, on textual conventions, on content, on meaning, and really, yeah, the accuracy is maybe not what we want to and can really assess in, 
in that way uh, inviting, but it may be something we can do in the speaking, in certain speaking tasks where it's not, at, at least at the moment, possible to use machine translation. Use authentic and context sensitive tasks. So obviously the context is something <clears throat> that the human can interpret well and react to. And this is where maybe also an important focus can be. Uh, and as already mentioned, developing metalinguistic aware awareness. The issue is that a uh, beginner learner can produce texts they, they won't understand. They are basically too difficult for them to do anything meaningful with them. So uh, they need to learn some uh, ways of uh, better ways of uh, understanding language and how language works so that they can also better deal with the output, for example, of machine translation. Uh, and in conclusion, and I'm come to the end, sorry for the overrun. Uh, as I said earlier, language proficiency is co-constructed, which is maybe also co-constructed with uh, computers. And we need to maybe on this basis also reevaluate uh, learning outcomes uh, in the sense of integrating the use of machine translation, for example, knowledge uh, and skills in using them, uh, potentially other artificial intelligence tools there still. What we also need and where there is not enough uh, is resources for machine translation literacy uh, to help students, but also staff to better understand. Uh, and I'm currently working on a project. Uh, I hope it, it's in the application stage. We've applied for funding to develop actually artificial intelligence literacy uh, and materials for staff and students uh, to help uh, educators, but also learners to uh, work better with these tools. And obviously there is further, further research uh, necessary, particularly in the relationship of machine translation use and language development. This is one of the areas also Jolly and Maimon uh, identified as uh, where the biggest gaps in our understanding are. And that's uh, the end of my talk.